thank you for the lovely introduction. And, and I have been a big fan of this amazing organization from the beginning. When I first heard about it, I thought, what? You're starting something at your, at your kitchen table? How does this grassroots organization take off? And then I hear all of the things that are going on and how many people are showing up on a Thursday night in the, in the snow. And I, I do have a bone pick with you, though, though. Because this is Syracuse, and y'all have a day off of school. <laughs> really? Really? I thought that would have happened in Cincinnati. So there wasn't a lot of snow out there for this cold thingness. Well, I am really happy to be talking about this topic. When Maria invited me to talk about this, she wanted to say, you know, what's the research about decodable text and the use of decodable text? Because that has certainly been a topic that has been uh, bounced around a lot lately. So I thought this would be really a fun topic to discuss. And this is, um, there's no downside. There's no downside to using the total text. So I'm going to start out with that position right there. And then I'll give you the rest of what I've got. And we're going to have some fun tonight. Well, I did come from Cincinnati. And have any of you ever been to Cincinnati? All right, a few of you have traveled to Cincinnati. Well, Cincinnati is in the southwest corner of Ohio. And there, you know, there are a couple other cities in Ohio that you might recognize, like Columbus, kind of in the middle, Toledo, and Cleveland that claim Lake Erie, but Cincinnati is at the Ohio River. My passion, really my family, they what I get up for in the morning and what I go to bed thinking about at night. Cincinnati, we have a couple of unique features. So if you've been there or ever plan to be there, have you had it? Yeah. Skyline Chili. <laughs> Skyline Chili is a very unique chili. It has a layer of spaghetti and then a layer of this runny cinnamon chocolate chili. And then a lot, mounds and mounds of grated cheese. And that's a free one. You want a four-way, you put onions on it. You want a five-way, and you put beans on top of that. It's really good. It's very addictive. Don't do what my cousins did. They came to Cincinnati, and they went to Skyline, and they ordered a bowl of chili. And they said, that was awful. No, you've got to get it with spaghetti. That's the only way to eat. The other thing, maybe Wegman someday will carry Grazer's ice cream. It is awesome. It's definitely one of the best ice creams. Maybe in the world. I've never tasted it and did that. It's really phenomenal. Well, here's something else that's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. You probably can do a little inquiry there. In May, my daughter went and summited Mount Rainier. And you can probably guess what happened on the summit that she was proposed to. And so instead of having visions of sugar plums, dancing in my head over the Christmas holidays. I had visions of caterers and photographers and, and uh, other things to do with wedding plans. See, because my daughter's in vet school, and she has no time for planning a wedding that will occur in May. So what I'd like you to do for a moment is think about why are you here. You came out, it's uh, not exactly great weather that you're traveling out tonight. Some of you had the day off. So it was a really good excuse to say, well, that's why you stay home. But I want you to ask yourself, why is this topic important to you? And turn and talk to somebody, maybe somebody you haven't met before, and find out why they're here and share why you're here. Go ahead and take a look. And administrator. Um, People who are parents who are just here because of their own child, not because they're also a teacher. Any, any some other factors that I'm not sitting on? School psychologists, reading teachers, good. Coaches. Excellent. Anything else? What? What? E N L. Excellent. We had a great mix. So hopefully. If you don't know somebody yet, you can find somebody who can be a resource or a backup for you at those times you need. Well, I know why I'm here. 
I am really about uh, targeting this independent reader and that accurate reading, independent reading, understanding of the text is absolutely critical. And that means for so many of our students that we have to be holding their hand and setting them up to unlock the mystery of the code. And that in, and it's not just about teaching sound symbol relationships and developing phonemic awareness, it's all very critical. But we have to have some tools in our bag so that as we're teaching sound symbol relationships, we have something that we can put in front of, technically put in front of children, so they can practice exactly what has been taught. So that's really what the conversation is about tonight. This is what I conceptualize as the path to reading. Now we're laying this alphabetic principle and we're building the phonemic awareness for the student. We're very systematically and explicitly developing connections between sound symbol relationships, toning, graphing connections. We're teaching the encoding and the decoding and the tools that we have that will most efficiently secure those decoding skills in the decodable text. So one of the things that we're going to look at is what's that definition of decodable text? What does decodable text look like? And what are the other kinds of text that we have at our disposal? So in order to keep me on track, I set a little agenda for this evening. And we are going to start with um, looking just at a segment of research. A lot of research out there for beginning reading instruction, continuing with reading instruction, but we're going to look at this a segment of research and the terms and definitions that connect with what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about various phases of reading. Raise your hand if you know, raise your hand high if you're really familiar with this, and raise your hand kind of low if you're like, yeah, I've heard of it, but not only sure about how this applies to my classroom work. So. Okay, or you know, you've got nothing on Aries stages, that's fine too. And I want to pull Aries stages together because to me, I like conceptual stuff. But the conceptual stuff may only take us so far unless we can make connections to the classroom. So that's what I want us to do together tonight is look at where are our students along Aries stages of reading? How does this connect to the classroom? How does it direct? the instructional needs of our students and what we can do with the tools that we can use with them. I want to have you, I'm going to set you up to dig into the decodable text. So I'm going to give you some guidelines for perusing the decodable text. I'm going to do uh, very great things and I'm going to send you out of this room to, to look at a lot of decodable text out there I'm going to give you some things to think about so you can look at it as very savvy consumers. Then I'm going to hope that you can come back. <laughs> if you don't come back, I'm just going to talk to an extra room for the rest of the time. Now I'm going to hope you can come back so that we'll talk a little bit first because we're going to be looking at how to use the text and how to choose the text. I also want to show you something that I think you're really, really, really going to like. And that's a systematic procedure for using decodable text to get students from isolated skills to application in text. Because a lot of us do this all the time. I'm going to give you something that's very, very systematic a couple of different times. We're also going to be looking at a multiple text approach because we know our students need a lot of exposure to a lot of different kinds of text. So I'm going to propose something that you're going to say, well, that's not a big idea. Of course, everybody should be doing that. But then we'll have to walk out of here saying, is it what we actually do? And if not, how do we make that happen? And then before we're going to wrap up and send you out of the So one of the current controversies that we've been facing, and a lot of if you are spell talker or follow a lot of the, the, the chatters and the blogs, is what is the goal of the total text? Does it have an actual role? Is it more beneficial for students to use decodable text than level text? There's been a lot of conversation of that of late. And I am here to tell you that there are not a lot of empirical studies that have actually looked at the use of decodable text versus the use of level text in order to secure students 
at that beginning reading acquisition stage. And then we'll look at why that is. But let's warm up a little bit before we get too researchy. Let's do a little warm up with connection. In your handout or in your packet, you have something that looks like this. Pull this out. And just take them on. You only need half size right now. Pull it out. It should look just like that. And in one minute, I want you to write the first thoughts that come to mind for each of these terms. And then take a moment to compare your responses to your neighbors. Familiar terms is a lesson to text match. And that's a really important concept that has been talked about before at other reading league sessions because it's a feature that is sometimes noted in research. And Dr. Maria Murray is going to help with some conversation about research in a minute and look at some of the research that she has done that is focused on lesson to text match. I'm not going to go through and define all of these things with you, but I do want to bring out some points and wanted you to wanted just to get your uh, overview of these pieces. The common text types that you might be using in the classroom are high frequency texts. These are commonly used as basal. You know, back when I started teaching, that was about the only thing that we had available to us for basal readers. So most basal readers were based on a high on high frequency text. And that high frequency text included both phonetically regular and irregular words. So think about Dick and Jane, two spot on, that kind of text. That's that high frequency text um, focus. Then there's predictable text. The predictable text is something that came along a bit later. And predictable text was created in order to replicate a more authentic and appealing language and includes a lot of repetition and often some really cute and beautiful illustrations. A lot of lines and rhythm to it, so it's fun to tackle. And I, I think about the napkin text as one example of predictable text. Predictable text is a great place along the continuum of reading development. We're going to want to look at where that might happen as well. Level text is something uh, probably that mixes a bit of the high frequency with the predictable text. And it combines those features, but one of the uh, confusing things maybe about level text is a different kind of level text or level on different features. So leveling systems across, whether it's DRA or Pontus Canal or A to Z, they're not leveled the same way. So they're not comparable. And often it's more like second grade texts or beyond for the text where you can compare the text. Because before that, the leveling systems are so based on either the book and print features or topic, concepts, the length of the sentence, the amount of high frequency words embedded, the um, a number of difficult words embedded in the text. All of those things will uh, color this leveling. So just, I just want you to be aware of those features. Now these are all featured, these three types of texts are not going to fall under the umbrella of the codable text. So the total text is going to be separate from these. But I wanted you to be aware because most of us are have these kind of text at our, um, our fingertips. And a whole lot of us only have level text available to us. And that makes that lesson to text match often very challenging. Because a lesson to text match is going to be the concept that we're going to look at 
that is going to compare what's been taught with what texts were put in front of students. That's what we're matching up at like that LTPM. So what makes the codable text the codable? Well, researchers have defined this, and they come up with two particular features. The codable text can have a high proportion of words with phonetically regular relationships between the names and graphics and sound symbol relationships. So by using the letter A, it's just like it's going to represent either A or A. If I'm using the letter, if I'm using CH, it's going to most likely represent CH. There's going to be a consistent, um, high level match. And the second feature is that there's going to be a close match between the phoneme, graphene, and relationships represented in the text, and what the reader has already been taught. That is that lesson to text match. Now, Mesmer came up with this statement, and I credit this to Mesmer, that the lesson to text match at LTTM is pivotal to the success of the use successful use of decodable text. So this is important as you review the decodable text in the hallway, as well as important to think about the text that you put in front of students, that just because something is labeled as decodable doesn't mean it matches what you have taught. So many times as a consumer, when you pick up the text, you've got to say, how close does this work with what I have already taught? Okay. Now, another one of my favorites, um, and I have heard, if you correct me if I'm wrong, that Stanislaus's last name is to be pronounced the Juan, something like that, the Juan. Even though it looks like that name to me, but I've been told it's the Juan. And he is the author of Reading the Brain. I believe that's the title of the book, something like that. Look at that sentence. Leads it right out there, doesn't it? And he does this in a way that's almost as if, why would you make any other choices? Why would you not do this? It's that important. Now, the people that he's often working, he's a cognitive neuropsychology, neuroscientist, I think. And so the people that he's often talking to are also cognitive neurologists or neuropsychiatrists or psych uh, psychologists, whatever they are. And so they take this for granted. The only people that don't take it for granted are us, the teachers, <laughs> the ones that are doing all the work. We're still questioning this. So I have to wonder why. What is it that's going to take us to embrace this information that those who are really looking at what's going on in the brain just think of as, yeah, all right. I'm going to turn this over to Maria for a minute because since she was involved in this study, she can speak to this a little bit. Sidewalks by Scott Forsman, the publisher, and LLI uh, Heinemann. And they were both used in all 50 states. Uh, they both had equal numbers of texts and lessons and so forth, but one exclusively used decodable text and one exclusively used uh, level text. And this study had a lot more into it than we're going to go into tonight because we want to stick with the point. The, the point here is this bottom uh, white box. So one of the things that was the most um, eye-opening was the level of LTTM. No one is going to say to you tonight that when you go out there, look at these decodable texts and think about how many of those words, what percentage of them match the lesson you taught tonight or, or this morning. No one's asking you to actually calculate LTTM, but it's something researchers look at to determine the level of decodability. 
a lot of those books, all of those books out in the hall are decodable, like you just said, but decodability also means that it depends on what your reader knows. So if they've only got six letters in short A, that decodable book out there with vowel teams is absolutely not decodable to them. It's really part of what the reader knows. So it's a percentage of the words with the uh, taught phoneme, grapheme, or letter sound correspondence included in the text you give children to read. Okay, and, and not surprisingly, my sidewalks is a very code emphasis approach. So the books were deliberately controlled to have, um, if they taught SH that day, SH is in the book. And what else is in the book? Other things that they had learned prior to that. Um, LLI is, uh, approaches reading from the meaning emphasis, not the code. And so uh, that, those are the kinds of things that we've noticed in the uh, study. Okay. More highly frequent words, a lot of repetition, a lot of predictability. At the very beginning levels, words like pancakes, rooster, and blueberries. Okay, so not a lesson to text match, but a very high picture match. So control, you can see that you can, this is a, con we're control freaks here in, in uh, education. How do we go forward this way? Um, and I think this is the only other slide I'm talking about. Um, but we have this interesting graph because um, Isabel Beck, um, researcher in vocabulary mostly, uh, has anyone seen, uh, what's her book on vocabulary? Robust vocabulary. Robust vocabulary instruction. Um, and she does, um, she had a lot to do with uh, vocabulary. But anyway, she proposed that 70 to 80 percent of words should be decodable in order to provide enough practice applying what's been learned. So if we don't use decodable text, if we just taught CH, but we never give children a chance to read it and connect to text, why did we teach it, right? It's akin to saying, I'm your flute teacher today, and here's where you put your finger for B flat, but then the song I'm gonna give you to practice tonight won't have any B flats. We don't seem to do that in any other field. Math, we don't say here's double digit addition, and then go practice triple you know, or something different. But in reading, we do this very often. We'll teach an aspect of, of phonics or decoding, but not give children a chance to practice. Nobody's also saying decodable text should last for all day either, <laughs> just for a few minutes of practice. <coughs> so here you can see that LLI um, averaged, we split all the sets of text up into 10 equal groups. And um, they hummed in at about 31% across the text. So, and it actually was um, kismet, we call it. It was just luck that a word happened to match what they had taught. So if they teach silent E, very often not one single book in the, will have silent E in it. They didn't try to match lesson to text. That's not their purpose. Um, however, my sidewalks, their, their approach is code emphasis, so they really did hum at about 68%, which is about what Beck proposed. And that's, I think, all I have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. All right. Very good. Very good. So this is a perfect study that I would love to do before I retire, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Master to children, and all of the children receive, receive the same type of phonics instruction daily. One group uses decodable text to practice skills taught, one group uses left of text. And for a variety of reasons, the likelihood that a study like this is ever going to happen is very, very, very low. We're not going to get into those reasons tonight. But I know Maria has a lot of insight into that. Sometimes we get tired of hearing the term research, 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 research. So I'm going to let Louise spend about, Louise Mo spend about 60 seconds, 30 seconds, just putting this research idea in context, the research that we really want to pay attention to, to contextualize what that actually means. So I can get my mouse to do what it needs to do. So uh, when we talk about the research, we're not referring to any one person.
We're not referring to any one site. We're not referring to any uh, one set of studies. We're referring to literally thousands of research papers that have been generated over at least three decades that inform us about these processes of learning to read. That's what makes this research powerful, is that it is groups of research, meta-analyses that have been done over the years. Ah, when I was preparing for this talk, I decided to send an email to Louisa Bowes. So Louisa, help me out here. You got anything I can use? Maria wants me to do this talk. You got any more empirical research for me? Here's the response I got from her. And she said, yes, I can share this with everybody. It's just common sense. They kids need to practice a transfer of what we teach them to the words they're reading in text. You go ahead and read that. I have a lot of respect for Louisa and for her thoughts on this topic because obviously this has been her area of work, her passion for over 30 years. And she also acknowledges that reading is probably the most studied thing about learning that has ever been, that has ever, we have more evidence about how to read, how to learn how to read than anything else about learning. So this is, this keeps me on track thinking this way. Here's another statement from some more from our meta-analysis of looking at decodable text over 20 years. And decodability is a critical characteristic of early reading text. It increases the likelihood that students would use a decoding strategy. It results in immediate benefits, particularly with regard to accuracy. Again, we can be great at teaching that sound from a relationship. We thought if we don't put that text, the decodable text in front of them, they're going to revert to some to another method in order to figure out what these words say. And the students who are the most fragile are the ones who are going to be the most confused by different types of text. And Maria brought up this point before. Think about learning anything new. If you've ever learned how to play any of these kind of instruments, all right. You, so you know, if you learn a few notes, then you're going to be practicing with songs with those few notes, a few strokes, a few movements with the drum. You're going to be practicing with those. But what if I do this? I teach children a concept of addition, a very simple addition. That I give them difficult addition because the concept is the same, right? I'm combining amounts and I get a total. Double digit carrying with carrying is much more difficult, and I need to create steps to get from simple to more difficult. So I don't advise that at all. Provide direct practice, <coughs> it just makes sense. So here's Aries' phases of reading development. And to think about now, where does the codable text match the learner's needs? And when Nea Airy laid out these phases, she was very, very clear that these are not distinct stages. These are overlapping phases. But I do want to show you some kind of a glimpse into what each of these phases might look at, characteristics of a child in these different phases. Again, the purpose being that if we know, have a sense of where they are, we know where they need to go, and that will give us some instructional information about how to get them there. So we're going to look at pre-alphabetic, partial alphabetic, full alphabetic, and consolidated. You may see the terms slightly different. Um, sometimes you see early alphabetic and later alphabetic instead of, and, uh, instead of some of these terms. But these are terms that 
Lynette Aaron using her last paper in which she deals with this topic. All right, the three alphabetic things. These children lack phoneme awareness. There's no phoneme graphing con connections for them. They recall words by teachers. So they might be able to recognize the word elephant because there's not a lot of words that look like elephant, but also there's probably an elephant on the page where that book is. Now, if this, all this magic works correctly, we're going to hear Evelyn doing a little reading. We will continue to include phoneme awareness in multiple opportunities to... Here's the name of the story. Why don't you read the name for me? Spell. I spell. I don't know how to spell. Okay, take that what you know about spelling now and use that. Uh, mm, ah, mm, the title is Buns and Jam. Uh, mm, ah, Mm. No, I did a really good. So he goes on like this. He's sounding this this work out, but it's very much step by step, putting things together. Dr. Deb does some modeling to get him to move along, and he will, he will. But he's at that beginning phase where he's starting to understand what's next for him. So the instructional implications here. So we want to secure 
one sound for each letter, one letter for each sound. And really secure that blending of the phoneme, preppy. Uh, correspondence is he's not there yet. He can sound these out, but he has to be encouraged and modeled to really put it together because he doesn't have that phonemic blending in place. This is where the decodable readers are really beneficial. Not in that pre alphabetic phase, but right here in the partial alphabetic phase. It's a great time to start those decodable readers. This is one place where decodable text is going to make a huge difference. And think about do you have anybody in that partial alphabetic phase? So let's move to full alphabetic. So these students have pretty full alphabetic or phonemic awareness. And when Dr. Pan Kastner comes back in March, she's going to be talking even about advanced phonemic awareness, if I'm understanding that correctly. Because so she's going to be working on that concept that David Kilpatrick's been talking about a lot, that students need to have this advanced phonemic awareness in order to have more complete and automatic orthographic mapping. Well, so here we're talking about pretty basic phonemic awareness and complete phoneme graphic mapping for basic skills. And they are growing more familiar with decoding and un working on decoding unfamiliar words. Now, this little guy happens, to, and, and these things don't correspond to ages or grades. So this child needed the message here. Yeah. All right. So remember that little girl was laying on the floor when she was born. Her brother had just turned, was almost turning five, and he was in preschool. Well, at, uh, after a month or two, he realized there needed to be some messages put on the door. He did not want to wake up that day. There's a thing. So this was pretty impressive. He was only five years old. He was at the beginning stages of this. This doesn't mean that he would be able to handle a lot of the code of text, but he's showing that his phonemic awareness is uh, you know, rather complete. But that's not going to be a major area of instruction. So let's look at another child and what they do, somebody who's further along than Ben was. This is a book about some sheep. And listen for how the word use is pronounced. Uh, the basic phoneme grapheme correspond. Analyze their spellings to help us know what font. Reteach and provide additional practice with the weaker skills to establish. Um, what do sheep is called a cue. Her baby is called a lamb. Cues have their lambs to in the spring. Alright. So you saw what he for why he calls muse cues, I don't know. I don't know the story behind that. But he's really moving along. He's even developing some fluency there and is using his skills, it's moving along very nicely. Get this one away. So instructionally, we want these, this is, a, this is the other stage, the other phase where decodable text is really helpful. We want to use decodable text here, it's a great tool at this phase. And we want to use that decodable text again for that close lesson to text match. We want to increase knowledge of orthographic rhyme patterns. So A I L, A Y, A I N, O A D, orthographic rhyme patterns. And then teach us more complex phonographing relationships like about R's, about teams, things that are tougher along the way. The consolidated stage is where we want everybody to be, where we're going with this, and that's where we hope, you know, for a lot of kids, the average and developing child 
hits this consolidated stage about when, do you think? Yeah, yeah, right in that second grade is where often students will hit this consolidated stage. Now, think about your struggling readers in these phases. Where do you often, where do they get glitches? Where do they often have, uh, where do you see some of them have the biggest stumbling block moving from one phase to another? <coughs> Which one? Well, yeah, but and, and so think about it in terms of phases. You think the phases that it's hardest to go from the uh, pre-alphabetic to the partial, or from the partial to the full, or the full to the consolidated. Some partial to full, full to consolidated. Sometimes we see a lot of glitches right in those areas. And so to know where to go instructionally, I think that's where understanding these phases and the instructional connections can be very, very, very beneficial. Let's listen to this adorable girl read a little bit about something that she probably has had has no background knowledge on. Consolidated students are reading about 110 or more words per minute, and they are adding thousands of words to their sight vocabularies. Mae Wilson was in fourth grade the first time she went to the Lotus Lantern Festival in Seoul, the capital of South Korea. The festival celebrates the birthday of Buddha the founder of the Buddhist religion. Twelve years later, in 2013, Mabe was studying in university, but she could, she could clearly remember how beautiful the celebration was the first time she went. All the people in the city paraded through, through the traditional area of Seoul called Incidon. So you hear her applying. She gets, she's probably never seen many of these words before, but she attacks them and applies her skills nicely. She uses the morphology of one word to go to, to another word, like Buddha to Buddhist. She's making those applications because that's where she is. She can. That's, um, she's moved along so well at this point. Oops, no, but we're not say that. All right. So instructionally for these students who want to increase, 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 increase the volume of their reading, their accuracy, and their rate. And, and probably that topic has come up, but reading faster isn't better. There is um, reading rate is one of those things that you want to be average with. Just like you want to have an average temperature. Reading rate, we want to be an average rate. Jen Hasbrook speaks to this really, really well. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to go back and look at some of her work or some of the things that she's spoken about more recently, that's very helpful. I didn't heard her talk about a flight like this before, and that was very, very helpful to me. So think about reading rates like an average temperature, going for average, not high. We want to widen the genre exposure for these students and a lot of work with multi-syllabic words because they really decode pretty proficiently. And they're able to use analogy. This is, these are the kids who are able to use those word families in order to figure out new words. So those word families, that orthographic line pattern that you're building, now they're able to apply them in this phase. You can't front load that in the um, early alphabetic stages. And this is also when children can really confirm or disconfirm by using the context after they've sounded something out. And that's what we want them to be able to do. Rather than using the pictures to predict or the content, the uh, context to predict, we want that to be a confirming feature. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. 
So here you can get the layout. And this is not, this conceptualization is mine. It's not one that area. She didn't conceptualize this in little bubbles. And it's really a lot more, the features are more complex than this. But there's a lot, if anybody wants to be more detailed references about the area's work, see me afterwards. I'm happy to show that So those are the two phases that we really want to pound in and zero in on using the decodable text, that partial alphabetic and full alphabetic phase. Because that's where you're going to get a lot of power out of using the decodable text of these phases. I'll go back to that path of reading, my conceptualization step. I want to overlay that path of reading with various phases and go again to the idea that the decodable text is going to be most helpful at what two phases? Partial alphabetic and full alphabetic. Right, right. I think this can be a really good guiding point for us as we're making choices, but it can also help that conversation with our colleagues and our parents about why we're making these instructional decisions. Now, the codable text. The codable text has gotten a bad rap for a long time. You want to look at that a little bit. Why did the codable text get a bad rap? And how does the codable text differ from level text? I think you already have a pretty good sense of that, or I want you to have some hands-on time with the codable text. So that would be how do you choose it, how do you use it, for whom, and for when. You've got a sense of when in their developmental phases, recognizing that I could be 13 and still be in a partial alphabetic phase. My age doesn't match to the phase. So an unfair rap is that the codable text is contrived. It's unnatural. It's inauthentic. Well, my response back to that would be all beginning reading texts is contrived. Uh, you, can, you might take a text that's based on a well-loved story, but if you're going to put it in language so that a beginning reader can read it, you're going to strip it down to some basic elements. So all beginning reading text is an element of you can try. The books are boring. Sorry, teachers, but I think it's us who are boring. This is not about us. Okay? We get the chance to do this year after day after day, year after year. Our students have one chance to be in kindergarten, one chance to be in first grade, one chance to be in second grade. You've got to play to their advantage, not to please us. You've got to keep that in mind. Students don't find books boring when they're successful. And nothing breeds success and motivation more than success. The more successful I am, the more likely I'm going to be able to move through those phases and be ready to tackle any text you give me. Some say that it slows down reading acquisition. Back to Chief and Manaller, the codability increases the likelihood Students will use a decoding strategy with results in accuracy. Hard to argue with that. This was from a meta-analysis looking at 20 years of decodable text. That was very hard to argue with. So we've got to step back and remember it's not the Julie Andrews system, like some of my favorite things. <laughs> but instead, it's what do the students need? Okay. All right. Now, let's look a little bit at decodable text. I'm going to put a few up on the document camera to point out some features that I want you to be looking for as you go out in the hallway. Cumulatively, decodable text is aligned with the sequence of phonographing instruction. So after a few sound, um, consonants and vowels are introduced, 
and words can be spelled. So I introduce a few, and I've got a whole bank of words. I introduce another, and my bank of words grows, and grows, and grows, and so on, and so on. Just like with musical notes. The important thing for us to recall as a teacher is that we have to be aware of the phonographic sequence that we have put in front of the students. And we also have to be aware of the high frequency, irregular words that may be embedded in the text. So as you review various text types, you have a handout on the back of your one handout. You've got a guide sheet. You're going to go through these points and then just give you some examples. You're going to be asking, are these texts part of the full reading program? And if yes, could they still be used as part of your instruction? Is there a logical sequence of learning graphs and skills? Which syllable patterns are represented in the one sold work? Which syllable patterns are represented in the multi sold work? And how common are phonetically irregular works? Are they noted inside the cover? Are both fiction and non-fiction represented in the text? And is the text geared for a particular age group? to come up. So let me switch over here to the document camera and just go through a few kinds of text very quickly. All these magic words. All right, here's one. Rex will not sit up. There's a level mark. On the back, but also here you see list of uh, introducing the sounds right there in the front. On the back, it shows you the range, the stages, the sounds, and where this book falls within all the other texts that are produced like this. Now, oh, let me just show you. Inside is a very simple, very simple presentation. Not a lot of text on the page. How about the cat is a very different kind of book. This is a hardbound book. It doesn't have any of that kind of information on the back cover, nor on the inside cover. It just has chapters. And so it's presented like a chapter book. It's still in a very, very simple format. The Best Bed is a kindergarten level book, and this is part of a core reading program that's phonetically uh, controlled. This is an informational text. It will correspond exactly with the sequence of text that's been taught. It has a list of the warm up and story words that might be words that are not matched with that decodability, but the text is simple and matches what the students have learned. Uh, Wilma Rudolph does about the same thing, but only at the first grade level. It is part of a reading series, it lists the level. It is a first grade level text, and it, it has no, um, it's pretty smooth in its proceedings. You don't feel like you're reading the code of the text here, but it has a different kind of feel to it. No pets in bed. All right? List of the number. This is a standalone power series on the back. You get the whole range. You also know that there's a program guide for the teacher, so that's available for you. Uh, it doesn't have any story words on the inside cover, but it has a very consistent, very simple presentation to it. And this is something that's a little bit further along the talk. So we are further along in the series. It gives you along the side where it falls within the set of texts. And you see it has a very sophisticated look to it, a lot of text. Uh, same way with Beach Camp. Now it's more comical in its appearance. On the back, it lays out all the different texts in the series, and I think this one comes to the stage seven. And this one does not have a list of story words, but it has moved along the continuum of text for quite a while. And finally, this is a magazine on the first grade level, again, decodable, but 
very natural in appearance, kind of challenging, but it matches with the sequence for that series. So what you're going to do for, what, 20 minutes or something like that? Yeah. Uh, you want to explain how it's set up outside? You probably all saw the tables out there in the hallway, so we'll have okay. a person stationed at each. We'll have a person stationed at each um, table out there to kind of point out features for you, but spend some time, uh, maybe this half of the room start down that hallway and that half the other hallway, and check them out. Well, I was quite impressed with the choices out there, and, and I, I hope that was helpful to you, to be able to peruse that pack see so many things in a small area to know what the options are. And, and I imagine there's other options besides what we're on the table, but I have no idea what those other options might be. But that was pretty, pretty comprehensive. All right. So you might be thinking, will this chick never get off the varied phases? Well, this is so attractive to me because it really grounds me in how I think about my students. And uh, Linnea Airy, uh, I'm going to tell you a quick Linnea Airy story. There is this really high ground education society for research. It's called the Society for the Scientific Studies of Reading. My husband is a researcher. So every once in a while, we go to this event once a year. And no vendors, um, it's just a bunch of nerdy researchers there. I mean, it's like David Kilpatrick and his, and his pocket pr protector, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm like, I'm not joking about that. So, we, the very first time we ever went, we're at this, I think to me it was like going to Disney World. Oh my gosh, there's Holly Scarborough, there's two cats. And, you know, all these people that I read about, and here they were in person. And then we're sitting at lunch on the very last day, and right next to me is Linnea Perry. Actually, I'll even cook up here. And my husband's just tagging away with her. I'm like, how do you know her? She says, oh, we're going to go back to school all the time. Okay. You know, I can't, I can just sit at the table and I don't even have one intelligent thing to say because I have no idea what they're talking about when they start getting into uh, meta-analyses and all these fancy terms I just to try to absorb, to try to get the, the main idea of what they're doing. Then two years ago, we were in Halifax and we happened to be hanging out with the Patrick. You know David from Black Pistol in that area band too. So there's a poster session and it's a big deal at, the, at this conference. Because they have all the researchers and most people don't get a, a session. You don't even get a session, you get 20 minutes to talk and that's it. So David Kilpatrick has his poster and when they have areas they're going from poster to poster to poster to poster. To poster. So David sees, I'm taking pictures of all these different researchers and composers. So that I got, got this, like, I was there. And, and David, David comes over to me and says, take a picture of me one day. So I did. I should have stuck it in here, but I'm afraid he's going to try to match the So it's that one that I did that. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I really did enjoy going through those books myself. Uh, but that's why I'm so kind of married to this idea of these phases. I really want to grab myself and always be thinking about how can I bring my evidence into my practice. Uh, we look at that the phases and go from clean drafting correspondences which we have to secure, to securing sounding out words, to phrases, sentences, connected text. And we're going to have to take it apart that way for some of our students who may be ready for some of these pieces, but even some of the sort of readers seem a little bit uh, scary to them. And so we might have to pull those pieces out and put them on uh, cards, on uh, sentence sheets to get them practiced and secure. A couple friends that I have, professional friends that I have, Susan Hall is one of those, and she has 
a company called the 95% group, and you may have seen some of their stuff out there. But I asked her, Susan, can I share some of your techniques with this group? And I explained what I was doing. She was very excited. She said, yeah, yeah, send me your handout. So Susan has a process that she calls the transfer text process. And I want to go through those steps with you, and I think we have enough time to really practice a couple of these steps. Then we're going to look at a little bit less structured transfer to text process that I got from Dr. Deb Blazer, who's also a colleague and you know, who's uh, brilliant in this field. You have a handout like this. And on one side, it has Susan Paul's transfer to text process, and the other side is Deb Blazer. And this first slide is pretty comprehensive. And, and it's really set up for a week of work with a student concentrating on one type of sound symbol relationship that you're practicing in three different passages. So there's four steps that you're going to cover over the week's time. The students are going to read three different decodable text passages. They're going to feature a W or AR, I think that's the one I chose. Or a syllable type, or a pattern. And the support's going to gradually reduce. It's one of the things that we find with our students is we're practicing something in isolation, but we never feel like they can gradually get better in text. So this is a very supportive method for doing that. So in the first couple passages are very structured, and the third passage we're digging right into the text in a less structured way. So here's what it looks like. The materials are rather simple. We have three different decodable texts. And, and, and so I'm going to tell you one other resource that I'm referencing in your handout. It's not referenced out there, but it's a free resource. And if you Google <coughs> West Virginia Phonics. You wind up with one of the resources being Hickman K-12 West Virginia. And they have lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson. Phonics lesson, but also text that match the phonics lesson. And it's all accessible to anybody. So those are the texts that I use in order to share with you today. So you, have, you start with the students are going to highlight the text for a pattern, a particular pattern. Then they're going to read only the highlighted words. The cursor just laser on those highlighted patterns. Only going to read those highlighted words. Then they're going to go back and read the text with the highlighted words. And then we're going to gradually reduce that support. So you see there's three colors on your handout. We're going to look at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The three different passages. So here's passage number one. And you, I believe you have this exact passage on your handout. So we're going to pretend like this is Monday. And you're about, our target is AR. So I want you to highlight all the AR words in passage number one, Art's arm. Underline or highlight. There's, there's nerdy ones of you like me. I've never gone out of the house without a highlighter. My curves. There's one right there. My line. This is a, this is a child's job. Highlight these words. This is day one. Only the first passage. So if you were a kid, this is the only passage you would see. All right, so let's read together just the highlighted words. Start with heart, yard, heart, arm, sharp, heart, car, start, Mars, arts, yard, art, mark. Day 
date lines. We've highlighted, we've read the highlighted words. Now we're going to read the passage with the highlighted words. So the, the title, oh, we should have, I didn't do it either. And then highlight in the title. That was my mistake. So let's start with the title. Bart's farm. Bart went to the yard to work. Code words, 
as part of the decoding phony graphics. So maybe you put the words in cards. We want the students to have multiple repetitions. When you have a lesson, a phonics lesson, it is ideal for each child to have in the neighborhood of six to ten repetitions of work. Six to ten opportunities to respond and read a word with that, that focused skill. And the, the students who are weaker are going to need even more repetition than the ones who can move along in a quicker rate. You might use a list. So it doesn't always have to be done the same way. And some people can't stand cards because it's rock on them and fall on the floor. There's a lot of fun things you can do with cards. You don't, don't walk away from the cards. Or a grid. And a grid's a great way to work because you can do all sorts of bingo-like things with a grid with meaning or word recognition. Or even having students generate questions, meaning-related questions with a grid. So the second day, then, we're going to discuss the word meanings. And we're going to bring that oral language into the lesson and use a context so we have to be aware of the text that we're going to be using. We haven't read the text yet, but we're aware of how sharp or start or spark relates to that text. So we're going to read isolated sentences. So I just created some isolated sentences that would feature those words and sounds of a relationship. I am really big on phrases and sentences. I like the idea of students reading a lot of phrases because that helps build that prosody. And, and, that, and, and it's not so scary. So just giving them something like um, a star or under the bed or cannot see. Little chunks sometimes are great ways. And then sentences would be that next step to it. And then we go to the complete text. Now, Deb doesn't bring in all that highlighting. You should be good. And you can vary some of these things with a feature of more discussion about the meaning. So Deb does an excellent job of that. And um, Susan Hall features more on that sounds of the relationship. So these, again, two easy things that you can take back immediately. Try them with your students. And sometimes you can find it's accessible to you. Now, this is the thing I told you about at the beginning, and I said, I'm going to talk to you about this, and you're going to say, well, of course, why would anybody do this? This makes so much sense. This is one of the very logical things to make total sense. We're working with students, young students, who are struggling with reading, or they're just young. And we know that their listening comprehension sets the upper limits to the reading comprehension. So we want to constantly raise a roof on that listening comprehension. And at the same time, we've got to build their automatic, accurate ability to lift the words off the page and encode those words so they're really reading. So I want to have a multiple text approach. And this multiple text approach can have decodable text. And that decodable text is going to match those phoneme graphics that less than the text match. I want to transfer from isolated skill to text. I don't want to teach that phony graphic. I don't want I don't want you to be like me when I first started teaching. And here's what I was when I first started teaching. I had no idea what I was doing. I realized that oh, you were about to teach me how to do the college. And I uh, shoot because I got 35 first grades. I had no idea what to do. But I had a basic reading. So I taught phonics, I taught spelling, I taught handwriting, I taught reading, I taught writing. It never occurred to me that these things needed to match up with each other. It just didn't occur to me. And then it occurred to me later that I had to be that bridge for the students. Some of the kids could make the leaps easily. But other the kids, it never occurred to them that that lesson that we did in phonics, I needed to be applying it to the reading text or when I'm spelling. And I didn't have the knowledge at that point to 
provide that bridge for them. It took me many years to get there. But don't be like this. I finally did get it. So we want the students to be able to have those pieces together. We're providing those connections with them. I want the students to be exposed to grade level text. Uh, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, whatever you think of the common core state standards. One thing they reminded us about is exposure to grade level text is critical. And one thing that we had seen over the time with our students, did you ever teach third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, or all right? So, what happens when you're third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade teacher, and you have social studies text, and you can't read the text, what do you do? either read it to them, or you just tell them what's in the text, right? Well, the more we do that, guess what? The less exposure to grade level text, grade level text will have. There's no expectation for them to read the text. There's very few students who will ever read the text. They don't all come to school with the idea of get her done, and I want to do this, I want to learn this. There's a lot of vision pulling and loving that we have to do along the way. So they have to have that grade level text exposure. And we have to be able to scaffold that instruction so that they have access to the text. We spend all day on that scaffold. We're not going to do that in this plan that see. Last is a read aloud. And this is where we really raise the group of the listening comprehension. Because we know that is very critical to their if the child is, cannot understand something that is read to them, they are not going to be able to understand it when they can it. It just doesn't make any sense. And their spelling and their written expression is never going to outpace their reading skills. The reading, you know, the reading is something I can do. Text is right there, and I can figure it out, hopefully. Writing comes from here. There's nothing for me to work from if I don't have those demographic correspondences, if I don't have that community awareness to break it down, and then I also have to have the skills to get it from here out my hand on the table, which means I also have to be taught how to hand and write, which gives me another day, another talk. So this reading aloud, read aloud is very critical. We're not going to read to students things that they could read to themselves. And we're also not going to say, okay, I'm just going to get the book off the shelf. We're going to be purposeful in the selection of those read alouds so that we're pulling these things together conceptually for our students and building that knowledge that content knowledge for them. The multiple text approach can easily be put into place, but it does take a lot of planning and thinking. But it feels right and it really fits. So finally, there's some words from David Sousa, who wrote Reading the Brain, or How the Brain Learns to Read. Sorry, David. Practice materials, food stories, main words, the other town correspondences over the lunch. Hopefully you are so tired of hearing that tonight. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Just give me the stuff. This is the critical piece. That love to text match is the best. Add another book. So what is that half of reading again? Half of reading the thing that we covered tonight and looked at the definitions, the research. We looked at airy spaces and we got tired of talking about airy spaces. And we tried to map those things together. So we wanted to connect that to continuum of student needs and student instructional tools. We have some time to dig into that in vertical text. And I think that was worth your time to get to match. Uh, I certainly would do that. I hope you have a sense of where the vertical text fits in for students and what is most powerful. Because that, if, if nothing else, that gives you a tool to have in that conversation. 
with your colleagues, with your parents, with your administrators. You are walking out with at least two systematic procedures for practicing isolated skills to test. And you've got to make the same steps. Practice it. Try it with somebody. Because it will be surprised. And that concept is a multiple types of approach. How can that apply to what you're doing day in, day out? And I'll leave this quote again that is burned into my brain. This is common sense. The kids need to practice the transfer of what we teach them to the words they're reading and the text. So see, here's three things that I want you to walk away with tonight. You will, you know, I don't want you to walk away though when I'm sitting somewhere. <laughs> Not you don't be that little kid. Use the decodable text at critical stages of students' learning development. The lesson detect match critical for their success. And try, just try, to transfer the text across the two like it. Just like you like it. Try it. Like it. Uh, I thank you. Here's my email. I'm happy to continue this conversation with anybody via email. But I also would like you, I don't know if we had something to say, but I'd like you to take a moment with each other and just chat for a minute and see if there's some questions that you would like to bring to the group before we disperse this evening. So go ahead and chat with each other a bit. <laughs>